Hey everyone, welcome to Vivid Eye Tom Roundtable. First one, end of day. Hello. Hey. Okay, I see. I see a few folks here, so uh, I, I think we'll just get into it. Like I said, it's an Ask Us Anything free for all. Uh, before we get started, though, just to warm up the crowd here, I'm going to go around and just ask, you know, is there anything you'd like the audience to know before we actually get into the questions? Uh, let's start with the top. Uh, Shane, any thoughts? First of all, thank people for attending and coming to the, the Q&A session here. I'm hoping they all learned about the fact that, um, you know, our ITON product line is a billion dollar product line. We solve a lot of problems and hopefully they found a lot of detail today in the individual sessions. Very cool. And in the middle, I think it's Harold. Is that Harold? That is me. Yes. Yes, uh, Harold. I, uh, as you saw, I, I changed location compared to yes. the earlier one. I'm happy to be in a in a warm location compared to Jonathan. Looks a little bit windy out there at Canary <laughs> Wharf. So uh, <laughs> uh, let's see what questions we are getting. Very cool, uh, Cosman. Anything you want the folks to know before we jump into it? Well, ask us anything. I, I just closed my DCA session. Looking forward to continue. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, I don't know. What, what are you doing back there? Yeah, I wouldn't be back here. I'm I'm in Canary Wharf and it is wet, as in the understatement. So I have to apologize if my connection is really, really bad. I'm going to downgrade your connection. Very cool. Awesome. All right, so let's get to the first question. So as we wait for that once more, uh, Shane, I'm going to pick on you. Uh, you did uh, trends for 2020. Uh, any one particular trend you think people should be focusing on in, in the new year to really help them? You know, I think the uh, the trend they should focus on is understanding how to bring hybrid IT components, you know, public cloud, SaaS, on-prem data center into a single view so they can move forward with the projects quickly and efficiently. Uh, Harold, anything on operations bridge you see as a, a trend for 2020? Uh, so I think uh, it's similar to what uh, Chain was saying, right? If, uh, as I said earlier in my session, to be able to cover the hybrid IT and transition customers over from the classical ways of doing to the AOPS way of doing, either for traditional or uh, cloud infrastructure, whether private or public, is uh, something that uh, is uh, front centers of people's mind, and we help customers moving forward uh, together with us into that uh, journey. We have customers at different stages, as you saw in the questions in my session, uh, where customers are thinking about, okay, how do I get from OML further into operations bridge with other customers? Uh, we're working on custom AI ops uh, solutions on top of our Vertica built AI ops solutions already today. So uh, work with us and we get you guided into that new direction. Great. And Camilo, uh, how about uh, with uh, network operations management? Anything in 2020, maybe on the roadmap or a trend that you see happening? So, so there are several trends, but I think we, we have quite a bit of innovations that some of our customers are not taking advantage of just yet. And I want to reiterate some of the, the things that I mentioned on the, on the Q&A session earlier today. We, we certainly want you to make sure you're making the most of your investment with, with NA, Network Automation, Network Node Manager, and Network Operations Management by upgrading to the latest bridge release, which gets you to the most current version of our product. Uh, so innovations around virtualization, around SDN, things around um, change config, uh, making sure you're automating your, your, your change operations, um, and then also looking at uh, things beyond that within the NOM suite that elevate the ability to troubleshoot network issues faster. It allows you to to make sure that your teams are operating uh, at, at, at the fastest means possible with the new user interface. Th those elements are all going to get you there faster by way of this bridge release upgrade that I was meeting, ma making um, comments around earlier. Um, it's something that you definitely want to make sure you put in your plans this year because it, it will alleviate a lot of the pains you may be seeing right now in terms of potential tickets that you're facing with support on. Um, and again, um, just the fact that you've got a direct upgrade for the majority of our versions, um, going back to version 10.1, um, really streamlines the whole process and approach and, and gets you to a more current and stable and, and high, higher quality version. So it's, it's really my, my recommendation to make sure you guys plan that out 
effectively as quick as possible this year to, to get on that um, 2019 release. Very cool. All right, so first question we have from the audience, they want to know, do you have any specific recommendations for IT teams tasked to help lines of business with digital transformations initiatives, which involves process changes around key applications? I'll start with that. Great. So I think, you know, I actually want to build on a little bit with what Camilla said in a, in a second. But if you think about it, these digital transformations that are coming, people are going to have to change their processes a little, modernize them. And probably one of the most important things to do, I think, around our ITOM software products is actually to get to the latest version. So you realize that maybe you have, you know, earlier today, I talked about having a value stream going across, aligning your tools to make that process more efficient to help on the digital transformation. To understand how to align those tools, you should get to the latest versions. If you're a couple years behind or some people are even further behind, that'll give you a better viewpoint of potentially you end up with a lot of redundant tools in there. You may have bought some point tools, let's say to you know, monitor the cloud or to deploy to a certain area. And now that the microfocus tools you own actually have that functionality built in when you go to the latest versions, you'll find out it's easier to create that IT process value stream to help you transform as those initiatives come in from business. Great advice. Um... Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Recommendations? Yeah, I think particularly to... as it relates to the line of businesses. Uh, so uh, making sure that you're using our technology stack to uh, show how relevant IT is with our uh, offering to the uh, line of businesses. Uh, we have standardized in our uh, shared technology stack that we're using for the ITOM environments around a uh, tool set that allows uh, to keep line of businesses and stakeholders up to date. We call it internally business value dashboard that allows you to not only very effectively visualize real time our uh, data that we have in our tool sets available, but also uh, intermix that with other uh, metrics that the business might be interested on. And as you becoming the service provider, this is a central IT organization for those different um, IT organizations, it's becoming essential that you're not just showing the value of your own group, but actually what the value delivers to the business and what business success it supports. For that, that tool set does need to own the um, the data itself. You can directly stream it in from a business data warehouse. Uh, and we see great success with customers that are doing that with their uh, companies in terms of showing the value of the IT organization, as well as uh, if you use it, for example, the customer uses a kiosk in their staircase for all IT employees as a motivation of their internal IT team as well. Awesome. Jonathan, I know you're always full of ideas. Any ideas for digital transformations to help people with theirs? Um, I think that, that that example was a fantastic one. I think, you know, part of, uh, you know, the, the value stream mapping is really important. And, you know, I think we just, we touched on executive booker, which is a fantastic tool. And I think PPM and the ability to actually look at it at portfolio level, is is incredibly important and you know especially when you're looking at models like uh safe version five now which is in preview but also it for it you know microfocus have got the best way of actually tracking it from end to end awesome and john i know you speak with a lot of customers anything that they're struggling with with their digital transformations And I think part of it is is this realization aspect. So benefit realization is always a challenge. So you know, part of it is you've got to understand what is it what you're trying to do. And you know, I I'm really excited about this whole session based on the fact that it's operations. And to me, operations should be the place that innovate. Learning from what's actually happening with real customers is the most valuable insight you can possibly get. You know, part of what my focus are doing now with the AI. Is me a game changer? Game. Awesome. How about you, John Jackson? Any, any thoughts? Customers that you, you deal with? 
Sorry, my uh, video jumped out. I just came in. I don't know the topic of the conversation. Sure. So the topic is uh, companies going through digital transformations. I know you speak with a lot of customers. Is there anything that you see them struggling with uh, that you think your tool can help them with with their digital transformations? So I, th I think a lot of it is in the automation space, specifically network orchestration. There's still a lot of customers that are doing things the hard way. They're still artisanally crafting Cisco configuration using the CLI where our tool can immediately provide them 100% uh, value from an efficiency standpoint. So yeah, there's a lot. There's still a lot of manual tasks that our customers are doing. Um, this energy company that I visited that I mentioned earlier on the previous section, they're not even looking at um, any compliance at this point. They haven't even gotten that far in their smart grid deployment. They're going to think about that later. So yeah, there's a lot of things that customers could be doing now that they just haven't gotten around to yet. It's more of a maturity, customer maturity issue than anything else. Absolutely. So we have another question. They want to know, how do you address the needs for end users to share experiences and shared issues sharing? You know, you have a big user base. Uh, anything you do to help uh, users with this? Um, Cosmin, any thoughts? Um. So the first place uh, that I would think about it are the practitioner forums. There is a lot of activity on our practitioner forums. Uh, on the, if you go to the item section of the Microfocus community, you will immediately see the section for each uh, product uh, from Microfocus, and you would see thousands of uh, posts on the forums. Years old, there are uh, veterans over there, so there are lots of shared experience between customers. Now, beyond this, uh, local events and uh, even events like this, like maybe they get the chance to discuss with, uh, uh, to ask questions uh, to us as experts or tomorrow to the partners who are doing, uh, who will be doing presentations. So I, I would say that uh, there are some, uh, good places to go for uh, sharing experiences and uh, also bringing uh, topics to our attention for enhancements like the idea exchanges we went through to a crowdsourcing approach for uh, enhancements where customers can vote ideas can submit ideas vote discuss them uh, pitch in so uh, we opened up a lot over the past few years <laughs> and became way more transparent on this. Very cool. I can, I can also add a bit to that. Awesome. Um, we also, for, for the network operations management suite, we also host um, bi-monthly meetings in, in the Americas, in, in Europe and Asia, where we have a special interest group is what they're called, SIGs, as special interest groups, is where we meet regularly with customers. Uh, we have R&D, product management, Obviously, our customers, some partners join and participate, uh, even pre-sales, to share experiences, share uh, things that may have come up, um, share their interest in, in share their experiences in upgrading uh, versions um, and using certain parts of our technology uh, and, and features. And also beyond that, it's a place to also have, um, from our side, the ability to look at designs that are being put together that are being planned for an upcoming release and and it gives us a good collaboration platform really to be able to assess whether or not a design element works for our customers or if we need to enhance or tweak our designs um so we do mock-up reviews design reviews based on new features coming out um, and we'll also have uh really a, an open floor for, for folks to participate in, and collaborate on best practices so certainly something that i recommend uh you guys join um for those that are interested we do have uh, an ability to join you uh, or get you into that program so just send us a note and um and i can get that going for you uh, that that could be done through the uh, pdl we've got so num underscore pm at microfocus.com uh, if you send me a note we can get you enrolled in that program that sounds awesome shane any thoughts yeah actually i i think everybody did a great job talking about the the ways to get in and share information with us. I think, um, you know, there is the forums there. 
that uh, Cosman talked about, which is 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 good, and there's got history there. You can scroll around, and then the you know the S, the SIGs, the special interest groups. That we have those for several products, and I think that's probably a, a great way for people because what you're not you're not just learning from microfocus, right? You're learning also from your peers and other businesses, right. and that's very important to hear how they solve problems to know how you can solve them as well. Well, that's a great yeah, point. Maybe, maybe one thing to add, as I mentioned in yeah. my uh, Q&A session, uh, we uh, a roundtable that we are doing from an, uh, in addition to what was mentioned for the OM2 uh, um, uh, Ops Bridge migration that we are hosting, uh, where it's basically uh, uh, a roundtable of uh, uh, experts from the field as well as from uh, the customer asking about and discussing how other people have been doing that uh, evolution uh, from the uh, existing OM over to the operations bridge. A uh, great of uh, interest shared uh, and uh, information shared between the customers there. Awesome, awesome. One thing I'd like to add to that, Joe, for you sure. a second. Yeah. And th that is, you know, we're talking about sharing peer to peer, but also I wanna point out that we have a show coming up in February in Europe and then a couple months later in America. And if you'd like to be speakers at those shows and share what you've done with our products, also reach out to the people on this call and um, we'll make sure, you know, evaluate whether or not you're actually ready to present at these. It could be a really good opportunity for you and the community. I totally agree. I used to go to Mercury World and, you know, just talking to other people using the products, you just learn so much. So I definitely agree with that. Okay, next question. I, uh, I, I, Go ahead, Jonathan. In the, um, you know, we've got Universe coming up, and I think that is the best platform to meet yeah. people. And also, they've got the customer advisory board, which is vital for getting great feedback. So definitely sign up. I know that would, that would be... Uh, you know, definitely go to the and North America universe event of 2020. Very cool. So, Jonathan, you're just breaking up, so I'm just going to cut away really quick. Uh, next question. I think we're going to pick on you this time, Cosman. Uh, they want to know, as a practitioner, how can I sell the use of DCA in our environment? Uh, as a practitioner, so um, I I see DCA as a great tool to use uh, to bridge collaboration to make uh, security teams and operations teams collaborate uh, better. So very often you would hear about uh, latest and greatest uh, vulnerability that needs to be patched. However, security uses their own tools, operations uses different tools, and uh, DCA could be a great tool where uh, both security folks and operations folks can uh, go inside, see their point of view, fix, remediate, demonstrate remediation. So uh, from a practitioner's perspective, uh, yeah, I, that's where I would uh, see the great uh, benefit. Awesome. So another question. Now we're going to pick on the NAM guys, and they want to know. What are the biggest advantages of using analytics within a network solution? Camilla, I've got I, something I can, to go for. Sure, I'll be brief on that. I mean, it's really being able to derive better insights with the analytics. So you're 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 collecting tons of data, especially as telemetry comes out uh, and becomes more prevalent, and we start to adopt and support that. Uh, the amounts of data that get generated, all the metrics, all of the device information that comes through, uh, being able to rationalize what what is important, what versus what is noise, uh, and then leveraging that to 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 benefit the business really. So uh, from a troubleshooting perspective, how do I identify a root cause very quickly by pulling together my config data with my monitoring event data to determine what exactly went wrong uh, with the network um, based on performance impact and what was the actual root cause, who made the change, why was it done, um, and how, how can I go back and fix the problem very quickly. So uh, it's 
delivering that level of insight and and information very quickly to the teams to be more efficient, more proactive, to really turn it to be more of a proactive network uh, management solution than, than anything else. And so we've got a very good footprint there from a Vertica Coastal perspective that we're uh, developing on aggressively to make sure that we um, are able to exploit that in our solution going forward, especially in 2020. And John, did you want to add something? Yeah, so there's a there's a lot of aspects, and Camilla, you, you stole a lot of my thunder. You know, for example, built into the product within NOM, we have event analytics, we have the ability to, to overlay change on top of performance graphs to give you kind of what is the root cause of a performance problem. But one of the things that's more interesting is we kind of cross over into some of the other platforms, such as in the operations bridge analytics. One of the neatest things that I've seen with uh, using NOM data is pumping that NOM data, the metric specifically, into operations bridge analytics to do the metric correlation. That's one of the biggest powers that we have. Um, specifically, you know, as Camillo said, as we start getting net flow data, we have lots of metrics. And the trick is finding out what metrics are related. As I like to say, it's kind of like looking for the needle in the stack of needles. With the analytics that we have within MicroFocus, we can find that needle in a stack of needles to find out which metric is causing another metric to have a problem. And that gives you kind of the root cause of when this situation happens, it's impacting this to give you that root cause analysis immediately using the machine learning and the analytics based within our MicroFocus solutions. Very cool. Harold, are you still there? Did you look, uh, your screen looks frozen. I'm still here. I'm uh, I'm awake. Uh, it was awesome. network and DCAs. Uh, I just liked how John was talking about operations bridge analytics <laughs> and the use cases I mentioned earlier. So all good. And I don't have the champagne like Jonathan has there. So <laughs> he's just getting refilled. That's good. <laughs> so the next question is for you, Harold. They want to know. Ops bridge. Can you share? Uh, can you share some more about how you see dependency mapping and service modeling aligning with I? AI ops, is it required or what is the real added value? So uh, uh, first of all, it is not required. So uh, as you uh, get in the data, uh, we can make sense out of the data without a dependency mapping or a full-blown service model. You can just look at the data, our algorithms that we have work without that uh, and do not require it. We could use other elements to understand dependency if you wanted to. Now, but I see a tremendous value if you do have a uh, dependency mapping and a service topology available, because you need to think about, you're looking at thousands and thousands of metrics. As John was just explaining, our correlation helps you to tell you, oh, these metrics behave together. Now, if in addition, you have an additional grouping of elements that you want to look at, where you know this service topology listens to this uh, network subnet, so you know which switches are important, which network connectivities are important, which storage LUNs are important in a storage array. Being able to uh, look at that together once you have a specific problem or an application helps you to quickly reduce the, uh, the mean time to repair for that specific application. So now it's no, it's not required, but it uh, greatly improves the overall time that you actually analyze the data. We can also use and build then algorithms on top of that knowledge of the service topology to actually uh, uh, automate some of the activities that we couldn't do uh, without. So um, it is not required, but it greatly helps in order to improve so the solution. And we are happy to have a good solution that actually provides us the option to get that service topology and dependency mapping into the tool set into analytics. Awesome. So another question. They want to know, we didn't hear much about RPA, even though it's a hot topic, I hear it everywhere. Uh, so Jonathan, can you give us some info on your presentation tomorrow around RPA? Absolutely. Um, so obviously, as you pointed out in the, the keynote this morning, RPA is an incredibly hot topic. And I think it illustrates why microfocus are potentially going to disrupt the, the marketplace. So operations orchestration has been mature products and the operations space. I think coupling that with UFT 
is going to be a game changing technology. So the fact that we're looking at more business process automation, so instead of just going into the, a very saturated market, such as UI Plus, Blue Prism, you know, those guys um, have, have taken a majority share based on their ability to automate operational tasks. Really, Microsoft is the only player that actually, can, you know, actually get down to the level of the, I think it's something like 5,000 screens work so it's you know i definitely recommend go to the rpa on microfocus uh, site and download a trial today you will not be disappointed awesome and shane uh we did mention a keynote uh, any thoughts on rpa yeah i mean rpa as we talked about can um you know bring automation that we hadn't had before in the itime operations platform because now we can start automating those products that don't have an API, but right, we have the GUI. And I think it's it's an important area that in the past we were looking at automating just internal IT type products. And now with RPA, you can bring in basically any business app into that automation. So it extends your ability to streamline processes that you know aren't strictly IT processes, but are business processes. Nice. Now, do any of the solutions use RPA? I know, does NAM do anything with RPA or plan to? So we we don't do anything directly with RPA today. We do have the operations orchestration component embedded within our network operations management solution, which is the same orchestration component that's used in RPA. Um, so we certainly will be looking to integrate uh, with, with RPA going forward. Um, in 2020, so we're looking at some use cases, but right at the moment we don't have a, 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 a linkage uh, aside from the one I mentioned. Harold, how about, so, uh, from a, uh, if you sorry. have a specific element that you want to automate yep. into RPA, whether uh, a, a user action or whatever, at the end of the day, you can use the event management system inside of operations to trigger that automatically. Because at the end of the day, it's just a tool set that is being uh, uh, integrated into. The operations bridge and we can integrate any automation uh, tool set but we also have out of the box integrations into OO and as Jonathan was explaining OO is as the heart of the overall solution so directly uh, tapping into and triggering any uh, integration uh, or automation that you have uh, um, done in RPA uh, could be triggered through an eventing system where obviously operations bridge provide a very rich uh, event process automation and event consolidation mechanism. Awesome. All right, another question. I'm not sure uh, who would handle this, but we'll see who'll jump in. Uh, they want to know, you know, we heard a lot about hybrid cloud solutions. Is there any way um, or suggestions of best practice you can help someone to start the transformation into a hybrid cloud type solution? I'll throw in there for, I'll jump in sure. for a second, Great. see if anybody else add anything else. I think one thing to keep in mind is, you know, looking at, I'm going to call it the compelling reason to move into hybrid cloud. It is going to be there, but have understand that reason and then ask why. And it might come down to, um, you know, we want to move costs to to the to the cloud, or we might want to um, be more responsive to our users. But understand those reasons, and from that, since there was probably some sort of compelling event, somebody you know changed a budget, somebody made a um, you know a high level executive decision. But take a look at that because you're going to need support from management to, to make that journey. So understand what you're going to accomplish, what's driving it, and you know who's supporting it. And I think then if you look at what do I have to do to get going, is you have to start looking for some of the bottlenecks you already have that you're not able to accomplish to bring that in. And I'd say you know one thing you do is you start looking at you know what can I automate, what can I not automate, what can I streamline, and that starts highlighting the areas to focus on. Awesome. Anyone have any thoughts on hybrid environments, making the transition? So I, th I think the other thing as you introduce specifically uh, um, looking into hybrid, uh, uh, making sure it's integrated well into uh, the other processes that you have because your cloud, if you start into cloud, is not going to live in an island. It lives in a connection to the rest of the IT and, and you want to get insights into that from an end-to-end flow perspective so that uh, if you're trying to troubleshoot why all of a sudden your SAP backbone in your company is no longer performing 
uh, whether that is due to a uh, cloud application connecting it to that backend and trying to trigger something, right? So making sure what you're doing on that uh, cloud uh, activity uh, is well integrated into uh, the rest. And there, the microfocus portfolio is exactly offering that end-to-end -end understanding to be able to actually bridge the world that some years ago we talked about B-modal IT, bridge your world and help you transition into uh, that uh, cloud-oriented world and really help you on the path forward while we are still having the existing classic as well as the future uh, cloud type infrastructure and application support. Nice. All right, so next question I believe is gonna be for Camilo and John Jackson. So here's the question. What are NAM's key differ differ <laughs> differentiators? Easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, from a, so I'll take a stab and then I'll pa pass it over to uh, Camillo. So from a key competitive differentiator, you know, our biggest differentiator is scalability. Um, mm. Our ability to manage ultra large mega environments, some of the largest retailers, some of the largest banks, some of the largest airlines. Um, and that's, you know, they chose NOM for a reason is to handle the sheer size of a large network. Um, you know, we're talking with a single box, 30,000 nodes, and then using our distributed architecture, we can get up to 80 to 100,000 nodes under management. So that's that's one of the key things. Uh, in addition to uh, some of the industry first that we're doing is we're one of the first and only vendors that is bringing together monitoring with configuration management together into one tool. So that's a that's an industry first. Um, specifically, you know, looking like as some of the examples that Brian pointed out earlier, which was the uh, diagnostic analytics, being able to overlay a change with performance data to to indicate where is a problem. That is that's an immediate benefit that we have from a competitive differentiation. Um, Camilla, what else am I missing? We're so looking we also at. Yeah, yeah so those are really good. Yeah, those are really good ones, John. A few others, so content, certainly content and platform support. We support probably the largest number of vendors uh, from a device content and platform support perspective. That's a huge one because if you have a mixed environment in 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 your in your setup, that that's something that we we will likely have support for those devices. Uh, but beyond that, compliance. Compliance is a huge one, and being able to support uh, multiple vendors uh, on that compliance front, ensuring that the network devices are are meeting those compliance standards across um, vendors like Cisco, HPE, Aruba, a Checkpoint, Juniper, F5. And so having that broad spectrum of support is something that is also a key differentiator of ours. Uh, the last one I, I will, would also mention beyond that is also the ability for us to to normalize how we manage the network overall. So being able to normalize how you manage your traditional network, your SDN networks, your wireless networks, and your virtual, virtualized networks all within sort of the same um, um, pane of glass um, in a way where it doesn't matter what vendor you're you're using or where they're coming from, you're managing all those endpoint nodes using those different modern technologies in the same way. So from a process standpoint, you're normalizing that. It's making things a lot more efficient for your operations teams to to do day in and day out. And so that's another huge advantage we've got in the market. Absolutely. The, the normalization, I like to think of it like the Star Trek Universal Translator. Uh, <laughs> being able to change the password on a Cisco uh, router is different than changing a password on a HPE Aruba device, but it's still a password. It has different syntax. So it, it makes our users' lives much easier. And then one of the other things to kind of, um, thank you, Camillo, for one of the, the other topics there was compliance. The other thing that we do that also differentiates us is our three-dimensional compliance. There's three dimensions of compliance that we do, whereas most vendors only do one, it's, very few try to even do two of them, but we do all three, and that's uh, um, three-dimensional compliance. The first dimension is software, looking at the you know the operating system of the device. Is it being compliant from a version or patch level? The second one is the configuration of a device. That's a second dimension and probably the most important, looking at the device's config from a compliance standpoint. 
And then the third is diagnostics. Sometimes there's data in that device that isn't readily apparent in the config that you have to run some type of specific command in order to determine whether or not that device is being compliant. We do all three of those, whereas most vendors struggle to do two and very few do one very well. We do all three. Very cool. All right, next question. Once again, I believe it's non-based. I want to know. What other products are natural cross cells with NOM? Excellent question. <laughs> I, I, think we, I think we already mentioned one. We uh, mentioned, you know, Operations Bridge has a lot of natural integrations uh, with NOM. I mentioned specifically the, the analytics piece of, of Operations Bridge. There's the, you know, current offering that we have called Operations Bridge Analytics, as well as the roadmap into the future of what uh, Operations Bridge is going to provide with COSO. And our shared platform. Uh, you guys also mentioned operations orchestration, which is now bundled into the network operations management licensing. So there's a lot of additional automation and orchestration that you can do on your network devices, um, which is OO, of course. Um, we also have quite a good story integrating with the uh, our service management, as in SMACs. So there's a good um, cross cross portfolio interaction, being able to do the change approval, sending a trouble ticket into SMACs from network automation or NOM in this case to get approved before you actually make that change on the device and have that in a bi-directional fashion so that once that change is approved in SMACs that it can come back down to network automation, automation to have that change remediated. Um, what's another one? Um, an another new use case that we're pursuing in the in the the auspices of, of cross platform collaboration is integrating with ArcSight um, from our security team of Microfocus. There are some fantastic use cases of bringing in you know syslog data from you know not only coming from ArcSight into NOM but also sending those network events into ArcSight ESM uh, to give ESM some visibility into the state of the network devices. When there is a critical security issue or a breach in a network, it might be kind of nice to know that if there are particular network devices that have a vulnerability, you would want to set the priority on that device or that incident to say, hey, you need to look at these devices first because they haven't been patched because of some change window or some reason why those devices were not patched. But now that we have an attack, we know that these devices are vulnerable. I'm going, to, I'm going to escalate or increase the severity of that event to make that a more critical security incident based upon some knowledge that we have from NOM. So there's a great example right there between NOM and ArcSight. Anything I missed, Camilla? Those are really good ones, John. Uh, the only other one I would add has to do with uh, making sure if, if we're looking at security, and our security teams or your security teams are are very much in 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 focus with the network and the state of the data center for servers and databases that type of uh infrastructure we have a, a very good dashboard a risk a compliance and risk dashboard dashboard if you will for both dca and for nom that are very much um uh, in line aligned in terms of what can be displayed to show the current state of the network the current state of the data center. And so those two are very key uh, solutions to represent exactly what what is vulnerable, what needs attention by the teams. And so that would be another one I would add to the, to the mix. Awesome, so uh, next question. And I don't know if this is the case with the Ericton and Itam, uh, it's just a generic uh, statement, I guess. What is really being done to improve online support? We love the product, but the support is killing us and causing management to look at other products. Um, yeah, I'll take that because okay. I'll take the one of the reasons I uh, want to answer this is I've actually been working with the support team and I can say that over the last week um, we already have a so one of the issues right is when you call um, online support is um, they need to know more about the issue they need to, I mean they need to understand the products better than the person calling and I'd say it, but it, some of that simply comes down to increasing the amount of training we're delivering to support people. So I have a couple um, um, trainings going on this month with support team, and I laid out a whole bunch more 
for February, then some more in April, and then some dated uh, Delta training, some you know updates as we release products for um, over the summer. So I think that's probably the number one thing that we actually have control that we can do is to make sure that the person answering the phone, especially those level two people and the level one people that actually have sufficient knowledge to have great conversations and solve problems and not have things escalate to level three or to R&D. So we're trying to add a lot more knowledge into the people that uh, you're initially talking to. Great. Anyone else have any thoughts on support, making your product better? Harold, anything? Well, uh, it's on the same line as Shane, right? The uh, uh, knowledge uh, up ramp of the uh, support is uh, uh, something that we're doing in every suite. So as uh, Shane was explaining it, uh, making sure that is uh, working, but we're always constantly also working on support tools for the uh, the product. If we see something, uh, uh, pre-check tools, other elements uh, to really help um, identifying quicker the problem and troubleshoot quicker uh, the problem. That is something that uh, specifically the TS team in our organization, technical services uh, uh, team is assisting together with the CPE team in order to uh, improve the overall uh, experience. Yeah, I'm going to build on that a little if it's okay, Joe. Sure. Because yeah. I think, you you know, I touched about uh, people being embedded the other end, and Harold brought in the fact that, yes, what can we do better in the product? So some things we can do is make it easier for customers to understand which might have went wrong in the products, which is what Harold's talking about. And then there's the general thing I think that we get better at um, every release, which is trying to figure out that the tools be a little smarter and self-diagnostic, right? We're not to the point where our tools call home and say, look, I realize there's a problem and you need to fix it. But I think that's also something that we look at from the product management side is always, what do we do to our tools to lower the cost of ownership? And sometimes that's a technology change. Sometimes it's improving um, just the way we, we tell people we see things starting to go wrong. But that is actually kind of a third axis we look at as well. Absolutely. Okay, I'm told that there's someone in a blank square that has audio but no video. So let's see if they're here. Uh, Steve Anderson, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So, Steve, uh, I, I, you're the DP expert. Anything you want to share with the folks around DP? I know you didn't do the session, but is one feature about DP uh, you think people should know actually about? Actually, on uh, SMACs. SMACs. Sorry, Here's SMACs. It. SMA, Service Management Automation. Any thoughts on uh, SMACs that people should know more about? Um, <laughs> I could talk for hours on it, but I'm not sure what to share in a quick sound bite. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's a great tool to, to look at in demo. If you uh, haven't seen SMACs, I encourage you to reach out to someone, ask for a demo, and look at especially what the service portal could bring to your organization, if that's an area you're looking into. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see if we have one more question here. Go to Slido. All right. Uh, they want to know, is skill set to run these tools still an issue? Um, so these tools seem really powerful, but, uh, you know, I haven't tried them myself. How hard are they to get started with? Uh, Cosman, any thoughts with your tool set? DCA? Oh, uh, yeah, DCA. I can't really talk about the other tools. So the <laughs> I'll just uh, repeat one of uh, the customers who have been working in the past uh, year on doing a pilot with uh, the new DCA. He was amazed at how easy was it to install compared to the classic products. Now, uh, with the day-to-day -day usage, uh, Batch management, uh, compliance management is uh, a skill set in its own. <laughs> so uh, there's certainly some domain expertise required, but from an installation perspective, maintenance perspective, uh, things uh, improved a lot compared to the classic products. Awesome. 
And so for it, the area of service management, um, yeah. with uh, Service Management Automation X, we've gone to fully codeless configuration, which makes it really easy for um, people to come up to speed on how to configure the tool, which is a big difference from other service management tools where there's uh, really you have to have deep knowledge of the tool in order to, to do the configurations. So I would say mm -hmm. codeless configuration is a, a big advantage for SMA. Oh, cool. Very nice. Uh, maybe another thing to add, uh, yes, there's still a, a certain skill set required that is true from the common, but we are doing constant improvements uh, in various areas. You can see that there is, uh, for example, um, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the Q&A, when we talked about line of business, business value dashboard, it's a common tool set we're using now across the entire portfolio. So once you understand it in one portfolio, you understand it in the other. It's a fairly straightforward tool to do. Everybody uh, who understands essentially Microsoft Office tools that is able to create a dashboard more or less. Um, uh, that is a great example. And we are working on more of these uh, general shared components across the portfolio to make the integrations and the leverage and the total cost of ownership. As um, Shane was mentioning earlier on the support question uh, to, to improve. Other examples is as we're looking into the integrations of the um, product addressing uh, elements there uh, between the products that uh, simplify the overall integration, uh, make it easier to set up, uh, make it easier to work together when they are uh, working in orchestration so that, that the end-to-end -end experience for the entire microfocus uh, high, um, hybrid IT management or item suite becomes a, uh, a better experience. As for example, providing a, a very simple out of the box DCA to OpsBridge integration now with a November release, adding in uh, vulnerability KPIs uh, into the mix um, so that you basically can send event from DCA into OpsBridge and gain that understanding of your business service from a vulnerability and compliance perspective. Good stuff. That's actually all the questions we have today. Um, I don't know, before we go, if anyone wants to add anything, maybe a question they wish someone did ask them about their their product, uh, we can end off with that. I don't know, Shane, any last words of wisdom? Yeah, last words of wisdom is, I think you learned a lot about our products today from maybe the last time you looked at them, whether that was six months ago, a year ago, or two years ago. And if we do this again next year, you're going to be in the same situation, learning a lot of new things. We have not stopped adding uh, features to these products and capabilities, and we're going to continue doing it. Thanks. John Jackson, any thoughts? Yeah, in, in along the same lines, uh, and this kind of ties back to the last question with regards to usability, we're investing heavily in the product. Uh, for mm. example, we have a new user interface for NOM that is going to bring, bring you know the amount of clicks that users have to use uh, to get something done. We're making it more efficient. Um, as a matter of fact, I visited a customer down here in South Florida at a hospital at their help desk, and they literally hire people off the street that are using, that are working in their, their help desk, and they were able to even use the classic, you know, user interface for NOM to get their jobs done and without any ramp up in the product. So now with the investment that we're doing in the new NOM user interface, it's going to be even better for our users and have much more intuitive use cases workflows to make their jobs easier. And Camillo can probably talk a little more to uh, some of the work that we're doing on the, the, the click throughs and the user flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So really good segue there. Um, make sure you take advantage of the latest releases that we have. Make sure you look at the NOM user interface. It's, it's architected to be very intuitive to provide an end-to-end -end workflow. It's, it's aimed to surface relevant data for the end users based on the role-based access controls that we're setting up. So really, going back to the question from earlier, yes, it does require domain expertise, but we're doing a lot of work in, our, in the latest releases to make sure that it's one, intuitive, two, a higher degree of quality. A lot of automated testing is going into the, the, the releases that we have. And so some of the closing thoughts on my part are to ensure that you plan for your bridge release upgrade in 2020. Make sure you get current on your versions. It's going to it's going to relieve a lot of headaches on your part. It's going to reduce a lot of tickets. It's going to give you a lot of more value for your um, for your investment. So make sure you take advantage of that. We're here to help you with, along the way as you get started with that. 
Awesome. Steve Anderson, any last words of thought for uh, Smacks? Yeah, I also encourage uh, customers to stay upgraded to the latest versions. We do quarterly releases. If you stay updated, you always have access to the latest capabilities and, and uh, fixes. So I'll echo that from the other, other speakers here. Keep Perfect. up to date. Nice. Absolutely. How about you, Harold? So I, I think uh, uh, on my side, uh, I think you hear it from uh, Cosmin uh, with their bridge release on our sides of taking customers from OM all the way to the latest AIOps type capabilities. Uh, what you should take away from this is that at MicroFocus, you're really focusing on the install base and taking forward your knowledge, your investment uh, uh, into the future so that you can actually continue using as well as expanding into new areas which are state of the art in the monitoring environment, whether those are analytics uh, where we're basically sharing technologies and you can be rest assured that we are striving toward making uh, the usage simpler uh, and reducing the TCO for you by building on shared components among the tool set. Awesome. Cosman, last words. Yeah, so my colleagues already touched upon on uh, the advice on keeping current with the versions. We are investing a lot with the quarterly releases and uh, you, there are significant improvements even between uh, the release from six months ago and the current release. So definitely we are investing a lot on making the upgrades uh, simple. We're also investing a lot on usability, uh, on... Uh, <sighs> So uh, I guess my colleagues already said it all. Just keep current with the product, take advantage of all the innovation that we are doing. Absolutely. And Jonathan Wright, last words. If you're still there, I don't know if he is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm calling it. He's... Dark. Looks dark in that bottom corner. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. All right, guys, I really appreciate it. I know how busy you all are at, at Microfocus and you really are making excellent products. Awesome roadmaps, awesome technology. Really excited about where you're taking us in 2020. So thank you so much for participating and sharing your knowledge with us uh, for Vivid uh, Virtual Days. Thanks so much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, thank you for Thanks. organizing. Awesome. Merry Christmas. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.